Hello, and thanks for attending this quarter's webinar featuring Overn Principal Analyst Tony Baer, who will be talking about cloud computing, composite applications, operational intelligence, and big data. So here's Tony Baer. OK, thank you, Don. Um, as I mentioned, as you can see up on the, up on the title there, this pres the topic of our presentation is beyond BPM. Um, and so what do we mean by that? Well, BPM has often been associated with modeling rather than execution. I mean, you know, consider what, does the, what do those initials stand for? Does it stand for business process modeling, business process management? There's been a lot of confusion. And in many cases, in many organizations, it's all too often become shelfware. Many organizations have, you know, have realized valuable benefits from classic BPM, but many others have not necessarily always been able to, uh, to jump that hurdle and translate plan to action. Organizations need results. So in the next few minutes, we're going to go beyond BPM. We're going to discuss some new directions that are helping organizations get over the hump and put process models and business rules into action. We're going to focus on business process execution and the results that it can bring. OK, so here's our agenda. So how do you get there is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to cover the following points. First off, we're going to look at composite applications. In Ovum's view, composite applications are the future of enterprise applications. Then we'll look at cloud computing, because critical to the success of composite applications is providing collaborative environments that reach all key stakeholders. The cloud is fast emerging as the logical cross-enterprise -ac access point for collaboration. Then we'll look at operations intelligence. It's the results. And basically, process-driven composed applications can provide new visibility. This enables operations intelligence. For organizations in fast-changing environments, operations intelligence becomes the key to business agility. And then finally, we'll put it all together. We'll wrap this up in what, with what we call the new synergy. Success stories with big data is prompting organizations to look at how they could take advantage of it for competitive edge. We'll explore how big data enables operations intelligence and thus the synergy. So we'll essentially we'll wrap up by putting those pieces together, showing how composite application approaches are key to leveraging big data and operations intelligence to deliver business agility. As I mentioned, um, the last slide, Ovum's view is that the future of enterprise applications will be through leveraging what's already in place. Um, few enterprises rip and replace their application stacks anymore. Uh, it's just not worth the pain, time, or expense for the disruption. Furthermore, there is plenty of value in the form of business logic, you know, knowledge, and policies that are locked away in your enterprise application stack. The operable, the operable word here, though, however, is locked. The logic is locked into static workflows or processes that don't adapt to change. So why reinvent the wheel then if you can abstract when you can otherwise abstract the rules, the knowledge and policies to dynamically compose new processes that make your enterprise more responsive? By abstracting the value from your application's portfolio, the hotspot of development moves to the middle tier, where applications are driven by processes composed through rules, policies, and scenarios. Designed properly, these process-driven applications can be dynamically triggered based on rules and events. Composed enterprise applications accelerate time to value because you don't reinvent the wheel. And in so doing, they redefine the relationship between business and IT. The relationship is no longer defined or dragged down by impossible IT backlogs, but instead it's driven by the active participation of stakeholders. They improve, business, you know, they improve business agility because you can implement change without disrupting your code base. Composed enterprise applications leverage the knowledge and the wisdom of your organization, and it builds on it without uh, being hampered or being hemmed in by the padlocks. This is the classic case for business process management, it is the ability to make applications process rather than code driven, and to enable applications to be composed rather than coded. Now, on this slide, we've just shown just a few you know, isolated examples of composite NRS applications that Ovum has seen in action. In most cases, 
they bridge legacy silos, and in many of them they cover areas that are beyond the reach of commercial packaged applications. Uh, I mean, as you see up on, the, on this slide, they include, uh, for instance, you know, examples such as extending core banking applications. Chances are, if you if you patronize a bank that's been in business for decades, they have systems that are decades. So they'll have one system for savings accounts, another system you know for checking, another system for loans, and so on. However, if if the last few years have taught us any lessons, and if the new regulations you know are you know you know um, if, if the new regulations makes any sense to anyone here, it's that. Risk management is not a matter of looking at individual products, such as savings or checking. You need to look at your customer base. You need to integrate risk management across your product lines and your customer base. And on top of that, with the new regulations, there are, there are, there are increased you know, compliance reporting you know, obligations. This is an ideal scenario for composite enterprise applications. Another example is in the telco domain, um, where telco providers are essentially trying to go up the value chain and become, become more than just conduits. Obviously, telephone companies are doing more than providing voice calls, and cable companies are doing more than just providing television. They're providing combined services. Uh, they have been, over the past decade or so, assembling these triple play packages that combine voice, data, and video, and television. And many of them are also in, increasingly getting into the content business through pay-per-view, gaming, and that sort of thing. Again, that's the type of application that requires the ability to bridge over multiple legacy systems because you're not going to reinvent those business systems and those and those operational systems yourself. And then of course with utilities, you have a lot of utilities that are now looking at smart grids, whether that be smart meters at the household level or smart or smart transmission devices along the grid. And that in turn requires the ability to bridge atop a lot of existing operational systems and SCADA systems and so on. It is critical to the rollout of smart grids. So the next pillar that we're talking about here is cloud computing. And the, the operable issue here is that to get to the point of composing new applications, processes, or functionality, there is the need to get all the necessary stakeholders involved, putting all their thoughts together to build the next solution. So the key question then is if you're building these composed applications and you need to get everybody involved, how do you get everybody connected? That's where the cloud comes in. Now by now, probably most of you, you know, in the audience have heard about the cloud, are probably familiar with the pros and cons, very much which are summarized by the bullet points on this slide. And we're not going to get into the details on that. But we will uh, uh, drill, drill down mainly on what's the advantage for composite enterprise applications. And the key benefits there, as you said, above and beyond everything else, beyond the, beyond the core um, you know, advantages of cloud, um, is the fact that with cloud, you can get all the stakeholders easily connected. Because there's no need to deploy applications. You have basically a, a common, basically, in a sense, almost like a portal, which becomes you know, pretty commonly available. It can be through a web front end or whatever. But you don't have to worry about having to host the software, or more importantly, deploy client software on every stakeholder's desktop. And of course, it all brings that in, you know, it brings stakeholders into the picture, into the picture with minimal effort, bus, or cost. So operations intelligence. Another key hurdle for developers of these, of the new generation of compo composed enterprise, ap enterprise applications is that you need to show results. You need to provide visibility. Now, using a process-driven approach, you can basically provide process visibility. In other words, that the logic by which your applications, you know, essentially, um, you know, enforce or, or execute, it becomes very visible because it's all process-driven and, and basically it's all, you basically have declared the rules, the policies, and these are the actions that you take when these conditions occur. That's process visibility. But the key hurdle then at that point is, OK, so we put this together. We believe that we're more agile, we're more responsive, but can you prove it? And that's where operations intelligence comes in. Um, operations intelligence provides the feedback loop to composite you know, enterprise applications. Um, 
and allows subject matter experts to explore real-time operations data. And obviously, um, if the dashboard is put together properly and it is basically connect integrated properly, it enables quick and smart decisions. Now, today there are many paths to providing dashboards and activity monitoring. I mean, they're almost a dime a dozen to top any sort of BI package. But ideally, the key here is that your activity monitor should not just show just any type of you know, key performance indicator KPI. It should be able to leverage the same process engine so it can provide real-time feedback on the operations that those processes trigger. That's really the key to business agility. So okay, now as we said before, let's put all this, all this together, what we call the new synergy. And the fact is, is that um, you'd have to be under a rock to have not heard about, for instance, big data. It's made the headlines, it's even made it into the general, into, into, uh, into the general, you know, to the mass media. The question is, of course, where is all this data coming from? I mean, why are we thinking about this now? And, and the key is that there's really a democratization going on. One is that is now greater access than ever before to lots of sources of data that may be coming from your own internal systems, but more likely than not, it's coming from a lot of external systems that impact your business or the way your customers deal with you. There's lots of data that's becoming available through public APIs from internet sources, such as social networks, or from public, you know, from public agencies that are releasing infrastructure data. Um, and of course, as let's say you instrument, let's say your supply chain, uh, as you deploy more sensors out there, just like, for instance, like GPS devices on trucks, pretty common uh, off-the-shelf technology. Um, it's not, a, it's not a big logic leap to think about, well, let's get all that data together and not just help um, you know, truck drivers you know, uh, basically uh, apply their routes, but also let's figure out where they're going. And you can, even, and you can in turn basically instrument the trucks to an even greater degree. As a matter of fact, if you take a look at the average vehicle today, it's built of sensors, vast networks of sensors that can tell you, provide lots of detail on vehicle operations. So as you can see, essentially, the amount of data out there that is available is exploding. Now, for instance, and of course, if you're a business that deals with customers, and basically that's pretty much the definition of a business, you serve a customer, your touch points are probably multiplying. That, that applies whether you're, let's say, a B2, you know, a B2B company where you have a supply chain, and I gave that supply chain management example just now with GPS devices, or if you deal with, with consumers where they're interacting with you, not just, let's say, through your call center or going to a brick and mortar store, they're also talking about you. They're tweeting about you. And you as a consumer brand need to know that. Or if you're a telco, for instance, and we go into this on one of the next slides, there are many more ways that your customers are interacting with you because there are many more ways that they're using your network. But the fact is this is generating lots of data and machines are just going plumb mad. And the result is that there's lots of data. The fact is increasingly, for organizations almost across all industry sectors, real-time decisions tend to, be, are, tend to be very data intensive. We sort of hinted at this you know, on this last slide, but what are some of the use cases for big data? Just to give you an example, uh, look at these mo you know, mobile gaming sites like the Zingas of the world and, and, and places like that. What you're doing is you're to provide a, a satisfactory experience. You're basically you need to basically understand the customer experience. You need to know all the players that they're interacting with. That's pretty data intensive. Marketing 101. You know, as we were mentioning before, if you're a consumer brand, you need to know what people are saying about you. And so, there's a lot of sentiment analysis on social networks, but it gets even more than just what are people saying about you. But it also gets down to actually sort of reinventing some age-old marketing concepts, which is basically identifying who the opinion leaders are, who are the thought leaders. And what we see in that slide there uh, on the upper you know, right-hand corner is an example of what we call graph data, where we're kind of mapping all these social tribes. It's like many-to-many -many relationships. You have, let's say, a group of, you know, of people that you deal with at work that may influence some of your decisions on buying your next phone, but you may also have friends that you see at home. Um, that also influences you. So you're a member of several different tribes there, and that just multiplies out. And the fact is, you as a marketer 
to consumers. You need to know who people are talking to and who they're listening to. And that's the essence of essentially uh, sentiment analysis and, and understanding who your market is and who's driving it. As I mentioned before with telco, there are many more ways that people are dealing with the network. It's not just a voice network. It may be your customers, maybe your subscribers, maybe texting. They may be using uh, doing data, the internet. They may be using location-based services, and they're very sensitive to service levels. And there's a lot of concern about subscriber churn. I mean, or and call routing management. These are not new concerns, but they're more complicated in an age of where there are multiple paths of access. This is a classic big data problem. And as, was, and as we mentioned before, utilities with smart grid are another uh, prime example of a big data uh, of a big data application. And so, um, so how do we connect this all with operational intelligence? Um, and we'll give an example. Unfortunately, we're not able to talk to a Cordis customer directly. But we do have some good information from some of their from some of Cordis's engagements, and this is one that we based off of a leading oil and gas and petrochemical organization. The fact is is that they they had you know they face pressures for increased risk management and governance, and risk management comes in a number of different forms. One is regulatory, and environmental, but another is economic. Because essentially, I mean, take a look at the oil situation today. There was a lot of concern about, with basically some of the, you know, with, with, some, with the political situation with Iran, for instance, shutting off the flow of Iranian oil or reducing it. How would that destabilize oil markets? Well, should we up, you know, should we up our, our refining capacity or throughput, or will it not matter? As it turns out, well, looks like some other parts of the world are in recession, so maybe things have gone to balance. There's a lot of risk in all that because when you make operational decisions like that, you're putting a lot of capital at stake. And so the fact is, is that understanding your risk position requires um, the ability to get a, a hold of lots of data, not just from a single facility, but from your entire network. And again, you, your, mar your margin of error is really thin. First of all, the margins, uh, you know, especially as a downstream refiner, are pretty thin. Especially considering the, the way that, that upstream you know with the prices that you know the wellhead are are fluctuating, um, and again in terms of basically setting your throughput goals, again very little tolerance for error. All this you're basically it's almost like a juggling act. You're trying to optimize your business in a world that's become a lot more complicated. So what was the solution? Well, the organization has already basically had put together a model of its of, of its operations and deco decompose them into processes. And what it, do, what it wanted was to get visibility on those processes. In other words, it's fine that they, uh, that they understood how their business worked. It's fine that they could be more, more policy-driven or rules-driven or agile. But the fact that they need to see results as a result of basically having uh, better capabilities to make smarter decisions and be more agile, was this affecting the bottom line? Was this reducing their risk? And so on. They also needed role-based views. Because in an organization like that, as you can imagine, there are lots of different players that lead, need lots of different takes or slices of the information. For instance, a production engineer needs to transform static operating values to hyperlinks that display active operating trends. Whereas a control engineer monitors control performance for, you know, for not just a single refinery, but for all refineries in the organization across all world regions. And then you get down to like a lot of the technical specialists, say like compressor specialists, who would apply business rules for, you know, to result of predictive analytics that they can use to trigger corrective processes as part of a preventive maintenance. Because once something goes wrong, it takes a heck of a long time to recover. The technology uh, was basically to leverage existing process model-driven composite applications, but essentially utilize data connectors with real-time feedback loops that are driven by that, that process model. The other limitation I should add is that top of all, of all this, don't add to IT bur IT's burden. Sounds pretty impossible. Well, solution was basically was to take essentially a model-driven approach where basically you can access 
real-time operations data by selecting relevant data and source ranges from a browser based on, based on the models that have already been constructed. You can then, you know, through this managed approach, you can manipulate large data sets from monitoring and analysis by a common spreadsheets without the worry of, your, of creating spreadsheet sprawl, because this is managed. You can publish dashboards and graphs through the corporate portal so you can provide that visibility across, you know, to the right portions of the organization. And as a result of this integration framework, you can get time-based or event-based you know, updates automatically. Um, and the benefits, of course, is that you're reducing your operational risk and you're optimizing uh, your output. The key thing here is that using this model-driven approach, it wasn't a matter of having to build dashboards from scratch and integrations from scratch. Users could essentially basically do mouse clicks, create applications with a simple modeler in less than 20 minutes. So in summary, as we've mentioned, composite applications are the future of enterprise applications because most organizations are not willing to rip and replace. They need to build atop existing applications so they can add dynamic flexibility. In turn, cloud computing promotes collaboration for putting composite you know, enterprise applications together by lowering the barriers to implementation and easing access. Operations intelligence, in turn, provides um, a closing of the loop for real-time you know, smart decisions, and so doing, by, by, by reducing businesses' rel you know, reliance on IT, it redefines the relationship. That concludes my presentation. I'd like to turn it back to Dominic. Tony, thanks. That was a great overview. Um, during the course of the presentation, we received a number of questions uh, from, from people reviewing this. So uh, we'd like to bring up uh, one of them that we thought was particularly interesting, and um, maybe you can shed some, some light uh, on this. Um, but here's this question here on the screen, given the requirements of computer power uh, needed to deliver uh, big data, do you see this as something that will naturally evolve uh, to the cloud and its capacity on demand uh, that work? Well, this is an extremely live issue uh, with the big data folks right now. Uh, in that, if you look on face value, or, or, or should say, when you, at first glance, when you look at it, big data is going to rely, rely require big infrastructure. It may not be quite so elastic as you might think, but certainly it's going to require a lot of infrastructure. And the fact is that unless you're a web or internet organization that has its own software engineers, we're basically rolling out large clusters is kind of what you do every day. It's part of your core competence. Or let's say you're a financial services organization that has, a, has an extensive background in grid computing, maybe some other areas like, you know, most enterprise organizations do not, as a core competence, know how to set up large commodity grids. Now, there are a lot of different solutions to that, and I won't get sidetracked on that one. But the fact is, though, on the face of it, it sounds like this sounds like almost like a classic use case for the cloud. But there are a number of considerations that you need to balance there, which is one, where is this data coming from? Because if you're talking a lot of data, we're talking multi-terabytes. Where is that data coming from? Is it currently on-premises? If you're going to the cloud, you then need to move that off-premises. Well, that's going to be a little bit of a, um, um, I, you know, that's, there's going to be a fair amount of overhead associated with that. And so, you know, there are, of course, approaches that can manage that, but that's certainly not going to be a positive factor. But on the other hand, where's all this big data coming from? And if it's coming from off-premises, then that basically changes, you know, basically ch you know, uh, changes the variables. And the fact is that at that point, it's a matter of harvesting the data where it is, or, mo or moving it either to your, you know, to your compute center or to another compute center. At that point, it becomes a wash. Then the issue becomes: Does this basically jibe with your corporate, you know, data stewardship practices? Does it jive with your, pol with your corporate policies, for instance, for what data you are supposed to keep on premises versus what you're allowed to keep off premises? And that especially, that's especially relevant for, for instance, anything that deals with customer data. Is that data that you are willing to l allow off premises um, and uh, whether or, and will your policies permit that? 
Same thing with, very, with basically uh, very um, sensitive financial transactions. For, let's say, a petrochemical company, there may be a lot of key you know, intellectual property in a lot of this data that maybe you may not want to let go outside. But on the other hand, if you're talking about harvesting from social networks, you talk about you know, harvesting, let's say, from sensors that are, that are, out there, that are you know, outside the four walls of your organization, that becomes a different story. So therefore, there's no simple yes or no answer to this question. You really need to balance where this data is coming from versus what your policies are versus what your core competencies are. Great. Thanks, Tony. Uh, we have so many questions here that I, I think it would uh, take too much time to try to go through them all, but uh, we'll answer all these questions uh, via email. And if anyone has any further questions, you could email us at marketing at cordis.com, and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as possible. Tony, once again, thank you. That was a great overview. And um, to our audience, I would say please keep an eye out because we have a lot more uh, webinars coming to you. Thanks a lot.